Hey, Rebecca, I don't know if you got my text. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I can't see the chat. I can't see anything. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to leave this or do you want to leave this? I'm fine leaving it if you want me to. I, I've taught this many times. But if you want to lead it, I'm fine with that also. And I don't mean that in a. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I will lead it. I, I just want to make sure I would step it up. Okay, well, th okay. then I just want to make sure. And do you want me to load the PowerPoint or does do you do you advance it and you just want me to say next? Or I saw that when you did that, you had the whole PowerPoint attached to that. Do you want me to bring up the PowerPoint and run it? Or I'm good either way, too. I, I have it loaded into uh, uh, OneDrive, so I can load it up. Quick. Yeah, I thought I was sharing my screen, but if you can't see that, then I'm not doing it correctly. So by all means, <laughs> well, no, I see the screen. I see the hello and welcome, and I saw the rest of the PowerPoint there. But I just didn't know if that's how y'all had done it before, where you advance the slides for him or something like that. Yes. Well, in the previous session, I just kind of went over the boring legal stuff, and then Dave came in with the demos and all the interesting stuff. So I'm happy to keep it that way. Or okay, you know, does he generally you know, open up a course and show stuff? Or I I've been through his presentation and I didn't know whether he's he's opening up courses and showing them stuff or if he's just uh, uh, I, I but he and I worked on this, but I don't know what he does, but I'm going to do it. I, I mean, I have no problem doing it. I've done this a hundred times, but OK, uh, yes, that would I, be cool. I have okay. a ready if you want me to. Um, he opened up one of the peer developer courses that we've done in the past, but you feel free to like use any course you want. I can I have one ready if you want me to pull it up and just show some things that could be tweaked. Okay. The heading, uh, whatnot. I'm not sure if it, I, I'm not sure what that is, so I don't know that I'm going to do that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if, but but if so, it will at the end we'll get to the questions. I'll be happy to answer questions and walk people through stuff. So. Perfect. Okay. All right. All right. Do you want me to load up the PowerPoint? Yes, please. You got it. I, I'm going to I'm going to take the share away from you right now. So I guess we'll go ahead and, and get started while Austin is loading up the um, PowerPoint and we'll start with introductions. My name is Rebecca Adderley. I chair communication arts with TCC Connect Campus. I've been with the district for 12 years and I've taught online for about 10 years and I'm really uh, excited uh, that you joined us this morning. And this presentation has two parts. One part is just kind of reviewing some of the trends with accessibility and some of the legal considerations that we have to keep in mind. And then the second part will be the demos and Austin can walk you through some really cool things and tips and tricks that he can recommend. He is the expert, so he'll have some really cool things to show and I'll let him introduce himself. All right, well, thanks Rebecca. And uh, thank you all for coming today. And, and uh, first thing I wanna say whenever we start these sessions is, um, I'm, I'm an instructional designer. I am not David Denny. Unfortunately, David is having a fever and stuff today, so I hope he's not catching this bug I'm hearing called COVID something going around. Um, so he, they'd asked that he'd asked for somebody to help step in. And this is an area of expertise for me, so I said I'd be happy to lead the session. So the first thing I like to say in these sessions, and the thing I think David would say too, is uh, this session today is going to introduce accessibility and inclusiveness to you. Uh, I will tell you that my presentation, I'm looking at David's notes here, and one of the things I would say to you first and foremost is, uh, um, my name is Austin Haynes. Uh, you'll see it on the uh, list of participants here. If you'll jot my name down and just make yourself aware of me, if you ever have a question on accessibility uh, in your course, if you'll just email me, I will either help you solve that issue or I will get somebody to, that will help you solve that issue. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, universal design and learning, which is a, a philosophy. Unfortunately, like a lot of edgy speak, a lot of people start adopting that into their vocabulary and and and, and kind of, uh, in my opinion, regurgitating that and not really understanding it. I think that there's a, you need to really understand that holistically. And with that, you we'll talk about that at the end here. Uh, that's the way I would structure it. And we'll talk about why uh, when we get to that. But um, I want to put that bug in here now about universal design and learning. Uh, and whenever I say I'm available to you, that doesn't mean I'm available to you right after this and you can only ask me questions for the next six hours and then after that the window is closed and I'm no longer available to you. That means in November if you have a question and, and you need an answer for it, I'd be glad to answer it uh, and help you as much as I possibly can. And like I said, if I can't find the answer, I will get you to somebody who can. Uh, so David Denny is the name that's on here and David's awesome. He's another person that I think would say the exact same thing. That being said, we're going to jump right into it. 
Uh, we're talk the, the agenda today is to talk about federal regulations. Uh, we're going to look at accessible documents. We're going to look at online course accessibility, and we're going to talk about universal design. Um, universal design and federal regulations are on there. So let's and they book in this entire presentation. And so the first thing I would say to you is uh, if you put universal design in front of federal regulations, that's the better way to look at this. Um, I, 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 I've taught for uh, I taught public education for 16 years. I've taught college in one shape or form, either graduate courses or uh, undergraduate courses for a little over 12 years. Um, my background is art, so uh, when I say teaching online can be challenging, uh, I teach drawing and painting. Teaching drawing and painting online could be challenging and accessibility could be challenging in that. And so uh, I want to say that first and foremost, but let's talk about universal design and why I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I know what it's like to be an instructor. Um, I know what it's like to be a week into a course or two weeks into a course and all of a sudden get that email or that letter uh, handed to you that says you have a student in your course with accessibility needs and then you immediately would jump to oh no I've got to go through and I've got to redesign lessons and things like that. Universal design strategies are just ways of thinking about and designing things when you design anything and that allows for accessibility. So if we put that in the front of our thoughts when we're doing this kind of stuff and it becomes a practice that we engage in, all of this stuff becomes just another opportunity and I'm not one of these people that just quotes positive things and 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 I'm I'm definitely somebody who believes in the hard work that goes into it. So when we're talking about these things today, I've been through uh, as many accessibility courses as I can find. I'm about to take another course on universal design strategies uh, and learning different ways to present it to faculty. But I want to say that that's at the end for a reason. When David and I talk about designing this, I put it at the end of mine. I've delivered content on accessibility and on universal design. And so that's going to be peppered in everything we talk about today. Excuse me, going forward. Um, so common accessibility features that you're kind of aware of is you open up a Word document. Uh, it's at 25%. The text is too big. You look down in the right hand corner. You pull that little scuzzy slider over and it makes the document get up bigger and you can jump it all the way up where the text is an inch big if you want to read that. Um, that's an accessibility feature. Touch screens on a computer screen, or in this case, it's showing a, a smart device, a smartphone. Um, that's an accessibility feature. That's a visual interactive feature that can allow somebody to touch a screen and interact with the content. Uh, visual support for auditory information. That's a fancy way of saying I have it in there as an audio file, a video file, and I also have a Word document that has it on there. So a screen reader can read it. A uh, Braille reader can read a, a text document, so a Word document. A video can be seen by somebody who has hearing impairment. You can turn on the closed captioning and they'll be able to read the captioning in, uh, underneath the video. And you can take the audio off of the video and then you have an audio file of that content. And that is for somebody who has a vision impairment. Closed captioning is a representation of that text under a video. Text to speech is somebody who is uh, paraplegic and can't, doesn't have access to their arms. They can use Word by opening Word using a software like Dragon and doing text to speech and be able to type out a document. We also use it whenever you're driving in your car. If you have a new car, that's an accessibility feature now. It's not because uh, you have a physical limitation, but it's because you are uh, um, what they call uh, contemporaneously limited because you're driving in a car and for safety's sake, you're able to do text to speech to respond to text and also to read text while you're driving down the street without lifting your phone up and obstructing your view while you're driving. And then voice recognition is the same thing when you get in your car and your phone rings, you can say answer phone or when it says Jan is calling, you can say answer Jan's call or decline Jan's call because I don't want to talk to her. Um, sorry. Uh, so those are all features that we're kind of aware of and those are accessibility ways and those tools can be utilized in your online course. So uh, going forward, I'm looking at Dave's notes. And he may have mentioned this. I, I got to read through them cursorily before we did this. But uh, what I'll say to you is that we're about to enter a semester for the first time where a lot of students are going to have their first first day online teaching. And you may be one of the instructors who's having your first day online teaching a student who's having their first day online taking a course. Um, when we got thrown into this COVID situation, it was after spring break and we all got thrown into that into the pool whether we liked it or not, because we just weren't going back to school. So a lot of students who have, have accessibility needs 
they tend to default to courses face to face because um, they can interact with the actual instructor. This semester, they're not going to be able to do that. They're going to have to take an online course. So accessibility needs may be something that gets keyed up really fast in your uh, spectrum of understanding in relation to your student uh, um, students in your course. And so building these uh, ideas and strategies at this point while we're in the summer getting ready for fall are going to help you be more successful in the fall semester and to help your students be more successful. And that's what this is all about. So that moving forward, I'm going to show uh, I saw this and this is a letter from the Department of Education and it's labeled uh, June 29th, 2010. This was a letter that was sent out to make colleges aware that they have a need and a requirement, a federal requirement, and this is what David put in there, a federal requirement of uh, meeting students' needs in, in, a, in, a, uh, in regards to accessibility. And so we have tools in place to meet those needs, but we need training to accompany those to support faculty. This is just, if I was doing, if I was explaining this to anybody or presenting them and telling them to come to this session, I would say to them, this session, in my opinion, is, is accessibility understanding. And so we're going to understand that there are tools out there. We're going to understand what accessibility needs may be, and we're going to understand how to mitigate some of those. But we are not going to have a broad overview of all the tools, but we can help you with that. So once again, going back to what I said before, you're going to be aware of these things today. We will look at some things, but we're not going to get deep dive into the tools. That's the point of contact where you will reach out to me or David or anybody else on the instructional design team. And we will uh, set up a one on one session with you or y'all can get together in a group and we can actually go inside your course and deal with some of the elements inside your course and help you make those accessible. Um, so this letter is the federal part of that. Um, I always tell people because accessibility is one of the big lawsuits that gets hit on colleges. The only time it happens is when a teacher digs in like, like a Mississippi tick and says, I am not going to make the content accessible. The student's just going to have to deal with it. Uh, my my best and, and, and foremost advice on that is never do that. You will open yourself up to a lot of liability. You'll open the institution up to a lot of liability. Uh, the faculty I encounter at TCC, they do not do that. That being said, I will tell you, and I'm not going to name names, but there are academic institutions in the Metroplex that have had that experience recently, and you can do some <laughs> research online, and it has caused uh, undue duress on those uh, academic institutions. So if you have an accessibility need that you can't meet, that's when you're going to want to definitely reach out to us, the SARS office, things like that. The SARS office, if they can't help you, they'll reach out to us. And we'll help them. If we can't help you, we'll reach out to the SARS office on your behalf and help you get to the student to get to those uh, needs being met by them. Um, so the challenge is, how does an institution meet its Section 05 and, and ADA non-discrimination obligations for individuals with disabilities when developing, using, and purchasing technology products? That's the challenge. That's what we're going to talk about today. The legal ease of that is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 was the first major legislative effort to secure an equal playing field for individuals with disabilities. But think about that. That was 1973. There were not computers on desktops. So the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 did not include accessibility concerns and uh, recognize that there were needs that were going to grow into technology and it engaging with uh, uh, students. So Section 504 uh, is where that starts to happen. Uh, no otherwise qualified individual with a disability in the United States shall solely by reason of his or her disability, her or his disability be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. We receive, just like all academic institutions in some manner or form, uh, federal financial assistance. So that's why this is an issue. It's a federal issue and can cause all kinds of grievances that being said, uh, that's that's the idea that it's legal. That goes back to universal design and learning. It's just y'all are teachers. Uh, I work around teachers because I like working around teachers. Teachers are givers generally and ADA uh, and UDL, universal design and learning, are where I really like to point teachers because it's the answer. And we can talk about all day long the legal requirements. I have a legal requirement if I drive by somebody on the road and they've been ran over. I have a legal requirement to 
stop. But more importantly for all educators, you have a moral obligation to stop to help people. Uh, it just is part of the social contract we all exist in. And uh, educators are big, uh, big proponents of the social contract. So the Americans with Disability Act, uh, which was in 1963, I believe, is the Equal Opportunity Law for People with Disabilities. ADA does not specifically name all the impairments that are covered. Um, that's because technology is constantly advancing the ability for people with disabilities to engage in activities that people without disabilities engage in. Um, so the web content, web content accessibility guidelines, and this is the WCAG. So whenever you see WW3 or www dot whatever you're going to, that's the group that kind of establishes the guidelines for making content uh, accessible online. They look at these things here, and these things here are related directly to technology. Um, seizure safety uh, is something that you may not think about, but if you embed a video inside your course, let's say you're teaching a history course and you embed a video that is a docudrama and it, it has a uh, scene that is taking place on a battlefield and there are a lot of explosions, there's gonna be a lot of flickering light. For some people that can trigger a seizure. And so uh, that's something you wanna consider in accessibility. OK, uh, for instance, uh, one of the things that is talked that is talked about there is uh, down here in the I don't know, can you, let me always forget where this tool is. My apologies. Uh, can you all see my cursor moving? Rebecca, can you see my cursor moving? I'm sorry. Um, I can see the slides moving. Let's see. I don't think I see a cursor. Move it again. No problem. I always forget where the pointer is on this thing. Uh, is there a pointer on this one? Maybe I'm thinking of the wrong thing. Sorry. There we go. Um, well, I don't, I don't, I'll go down these. Sorry. Uh, so we have seizure safety. That's something you may not consider, but that's something you uh, want to consider. A simple accessibility uh, addressing of that is, number one, when you load that video into your uh, class course, you can uh, you can load it in as an HTML file and uh, load it in as a uh, um, as an iframe in. That's where you actually see the little uh, screen that's the video player. Right above it, there's an opportunity to put text in that. When you're doing that, you can put in a warning that says this video has flickering light. If you suffer from any photosensitivity issues, please be aware and and, and ask your instructor for additional opportunities to receive this content. That's an accessibility address in a course. Uh, compatible, maximum compatibility across devices. That is taken care of most mostly by the software that we're using. So Blackboard has a translation that translates from Mac to PC. It has a translation that they download the app onto an iPad that it will uh, it will uh, uh, open it and format it for an iPad. Same thing with an uh, iPhone. Navigation. This is why when we're building a course, we have navigation standardization inside of our courses. One of the first things we have is start here over on the upper left. The next thing is announcements generally, then syllabus and things like that. The reason you want to do that is once again, all the students are now going to be online. It would be sad if they're taking five courses and there are five different completely different navigation standards inside the course. We want to create an environment where there is some equity in the way that the courses are laid out. It doesn't have to be 100% exactly like a course there may be a reason that you don't have that um but uh yes you can get the powerpoint uh daily on um at the end uh and in regards to that if, if uh you can't download it from the teams you can just email me and request it and i'll be glad to send anybody a copy copy of it um so navigation is an issue inside the course another thing with navigation uh using folders to embed your content inside of your course there's a uh reason that you want to use a folder and that's because simply whenever they open your course think about by the end of your semester if you just load everything in and it's just one thing after the other by the end of the semester when they open the course they're going to have to scan all the way down to the bottom there may be 70 items in there um, if you use folders each folder can represent a week's activities and the students will see time in there and that is a accessibility standard so that they can start to see time represented in their course and if they if you use that practice, then the other the other and the other teachers use that practice that standardizes once again navigation. 
Input assistance, help users to avoid making mistakes, make corrections easy. Uh, that uh, comes up with the faculty and you're giving feedback on a document. That's how you can, when you're using Word and you're giving feedback on it, you can, if you use the tools inside of Word to put notes in a document, students will develop those skills and understand that that's how they're going to receive feedback on their, uh, on their uh, documents in the course. That's standardized. And the great thing about Word and Microsoft products, they have accessibility checkers built in. So if you're using their tools, you can just run an accessibility check on anything you do in a Microsoft product for the most part, not 100%. There's a couple of things I will challenge them on, but you will have great success in creating accessible documents. Readability falls under that too. Uh, yeah, don't, yeah, don't show the movie 127 hours. People had seizure in the movie theaters like crazy. Yeah, also Pokemon, um, <laughs> predictable. Uh, um, make pages appear and operate in predictable ways. Uh, that's where you see things. I will tell you, that's where you think, see things when you're on the web or you're watching videos at home and you see web uh, advertisements for uh, content development tools like Wix, W-I-X, or Dreamweaver. That the, and you go to a website and you understand, oh, if I look up in the upper right-hand corner, there'll probably be a search bar that I can search this website in. That's an accessibility uh, standard that's created by the W3. Um, video and al video alter alternatives, like I've mentioned before, loading a video in to your course that you've created um, uh, allows you to have a video content in there, which has an audio component to it, which automatically, if we load it to YouTube, adds closed captioning to it. Um, closed captioning, actually, you could go in and, and copy the closed captioning off of the SRT document, which is embedded with the file, you'll be able to copy that, post it onto Word, and then you have a Word document that you can have the uh, transcript of your uh, video content. And now you have something for somebody with a visual impairment who can't uh, 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 use a screen reader because they also have a hearing impairment, but they can use a Braille reader with that document because they can load it into a Braille reader. Text alternatives, provide text alternatives for any non-text content so that it can be converted into other forms people need. So uh, David built this PowerPoint. And so what I'm about to say is going to sound like I'm being a jerk, but we had to build all this stuff early. So let me say to you what we're looking at right now. Right now, we're looking at a PowerPoint slide, correct? And up at the top, we have this uh, title. We have Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, parentheses, WCAG, per close parentheses, OK? Um, that is built inside of words. You're very familiar with that tool, or excuse me, PowerPoint. You're very familiar with that tool. So if I took this document down and was looking at this PowerPoint, I could type this text and change this text up here at the top, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I cannot change any of that text on the document below it, the WCAG standards that you're looking at, because that's not really text. That's an image. That's a picture of text. A screen reader would not read any of that. OK, so that's the difference between text in a in a presentation and non-text in a presentation. So that is text alternatives talk, but that's a big one because I can um, embed in this PowerPoint all of that information on that image by using the alt text tool in PowerPoint. I can write out all that text, put it as an alt tag on, the, uh, on this image, and anybody using a screen reader would be able to get all of that content. Um, I wouldn't do that. I would build it in PowerPoint. But that's one way to do that and accomplish that. I would not recommend doing that. I would recommend always alt texting your images, but that is way too much text to put in an alt text on an image. So that's when we're talking about that, that's one example right there live for you in this presentation of how to create something that's accessible. And sometimes when you're creating something that's accessible, that's the best answer in that moment. And if you had to do that and it was an emergency situation and you were going to use it one time and send it out, uh, I wouldn't send it out. I would use it that one time so that when people ask, you could show them what it was. I would recreate that and recommend it anytime you're putting something like that in your course that it's recreated. That is universal design and learning as a philosophy. Because if I build it that way in the beginning, I won't have to rebuild it later on when I have an accessibility concerns in my course. So let's go to adaptable. Create content that can be presented in different ways without losing information or structure. That's what I just said. If I built this right the same, the first way, I would have bullet points for all of those things, starting with seizure safety all the way down to time. 
that would allow me to construct that however I want because we all know how to copy and paste text. So I can copy and paste that text in a uh, graph, in a, uh, um, I'm losing my words right now, a, uh, um, whew, we'll get there in just a second, but uh, it's gonna, the word's going to hit me and you're going to all go, and this guy's a moron. Um, keyboard accessible, make all functionality available from a keyboard. That's moving the, using the arrow keys to move around. A uh, uh, um, clarity provide adequate color contrast. Um, we're getting a little sketchy here with the color contrast in the middle of this. When you see the globe, the difference between the continents and the water would not be able to be seen by somebody with a low uh, vision uh, problem, and so they would have a hard time discerning that that's a globe in the middle of that. So I would probably not include a globe in the middle of that because number one, it's not necessary, and number two, it could cause problems, and there's a little bit of loss. Of understanding there. Um, it's decorative. It's fine as a decorative thing, but I would label this as decorative. I wouldn't label this as this is necessary to understand content. Um, and then the last thing, time. Provide users enough time to read and use content. If I provide a text document of all of my uh, video and audio content in my courses, they can consume that in the best way for them. Uh, there's a couple of things in universal design and learning I'll talk to you about if you all talk about that here at the end, but I want to get through the presentation because I am at 126 right now. Um, so here's a example of this. Once again, um, all of this is pictures of text, not actual text. And this is an image from our, uh, in the instructional design department here at, at TCC, an image from our accessibility guide, and it walks you through how to do, how to uh, make things accessible. So for instance, if I'm building a document for my course, and the word I was looking for a minute ago was table, by the way. Uh, so now, you're, like I said, you're going to go, what's wrong with this guy? But that same information back here, I could take all this, and if I bullet pointed all this information and typed it out, I could build a table with that information in it, or I could just bullet point it out. But I have an opportunity to build it as a table, and we'll talk about why that's important here. Uh, first thing, though, very obvious things, but if you're not aware of this, when somebody is using a screen reader, like uh, the two major ones are Dragon or Jaws, but they are those. There are many screen readers available, uh, and people with accessibility needs generally have a screen reader that they use. But also, screen readers are available for students through this SARS office. They can download the uh, um, tool to their home computer or their laptop, so that they have uh, the ability to read those things. A screen reader will do this. If a screen reader was reading this document to the to a student with a vision impairment, the first thing that the student would hear is. Heading one, and then it would say syllabus. The person reading the document using the screen reader would hear heading one, syllabus. Then they'd hear heading two, DL 101, introduction to online learning, and then heading three, making it, going back here, so I'm gonna go back to here, uh, keyboard accessible, make all functionality available from a keyboard. Somebody using a screen reader will up the speed of the screen reader. So if, you've, if you're not familiar with this, Students can do this with your YouTube videos and things like that, or podcasts and things like this. You may be familiar with this. You can speed them up. It, it increases the voice. It makes you sound a little bit like a chipmunk, sometimes a lot, depending on your voice. Uh, students who use screen readers read really fast using a screen reader. Uh, you can go on and see examples of this, but they will read and it will sound like, I don't know if you're familiar with the guy from the 1980s who used to do the commercials and, and talk really fast, but it will sound like that. They will read really fast. They will use the uh, um, arrow keys to move through this document hi at hyper speed. I mean, you'll you'll listen to somebody who's been using the uh, tool for a long time, and they will go, you'll go, how are they getting any of this? But it's the same thing you do. We do. We we would bypass the word syllabus and go, yeah, syllabus, introduction to syllabus. Yeah, yeah, we get that course information. Okay, yeah, course. Yeah, we understand that course title. They would be stepping through that one by one with the arrow key, and the screen reader would be reading. They can speed up the screen reader's ability to read, and it reads fast, and they can read this just like when you you and I read it and move through the document really quickly if it's all created using the tools that you use when you're creating a document. So in Word, you would make this heading one, you'd make this heading two, you'd make this heading three. Uh, format lists as proper lists. You'll see that these are bullet pointed, so it would say bullet point one from the screen reader. It would say bullet point one, course title, uh, introduction to online learning, bullet point two, CRN. So the screen reader will actually add in because it sees that that's a bullet point. It will read and say out loud bullet point. 
So when you're developing content in a text document for students, be aware of that because the Screen River will also do this. Let's go over to the smiley face and look. Add alternative alt text to images. So when you add alt text to an image, the alt text on that is John Doe instructor. So when the screen reader gets to that image and they arrow over to it, what the screen reader will say to them is this image of. And then John Doe, um, some people will put in their alt, te alt text image of John Doe instructor or image John Doe instructor. When the screen reader gets to it, it will say image of because the screen reader recognizes that it's an image. And then if you've typed in the word image, it will say image of image John Doe instructor. Those are not the right way to alt text. And those are the things that cause students who have disabilities to go. They don't know how to put an alt text in. Now, I'm telling you that because I've actually seen multiple lawsuits uh, on the ADA website, you can just go to ada.gov and it has an actual list of the uh, um, the lawsuits, multiple lawsuits where that's one of the things that started to get the student or the person who's interacting with the content with a disability agitated and then they res they interjected to the uh, creator of the content and the creator of the con content came back with a less than caring uh, response to that. And that's what gets people uh, hackles up and causes them to go look for legal counsel. And so one of the ones that you can look up that's a really interesting one is uh, if you're familiar with uh, Winn-Dixie grocery stores, they ended up in a lawsuit about the accessibility of their site because their web content developer gave some responses to some, some consumers that were less than helpful and less than friendly, and that ended up engaging them in a lawsuit that addressed a lot of these issues while they may seem microscopic and minor and just an annoyance, that's part of the uh, the lawsuits that happen where students uh, kind of go after institutions and uh, dig in and, and lawyers love that kind of stuff because it presents well to a jury because it portrays somebody as not caring and not engaged and not uh, uh, willing to react to somebody's request for an accessibility concern. Um, if you'll notice, once again, I'm going to go back over here. So we have heading one, heading two, heading three, format list is proper list. Then we have a repeat of heading three. We're still using the heading tool, and they re uh, screen reader will say heading three, instructor information, and then it will read that text. We're using the heading tool throughout so that they can arrow to it because they, they can arrow across and it will just keep reading. They can arrow down and jump two headings. So if somebody gets interrupted while they're using a screen reader, and they stop and then it goes back to the beginning of the document. They can go, I was at heading three assignments and assessments and they can arrow down to that. That's why it's important to air, use the uh, headings whenever you're creating content. Heading four is now another subheading underneath there. So if they get to that and you label it grading scale, which brings us right to what I, the word I was looking for, table a while ago. If you build tables, um, it will read the table thusly. The first thing it will do is say table, and it will say column one, grade, column two, grading scale by points, column three, grading scale by percentages. And then they will, they will toggle down and it will read the rest of the content then. A co column, the grading and scale per, by points, and then it will read that content. Up. I'm doing that to you because here's what I want you to be auditorily aware of while you're looking at that image. Imagine you're in a class and there is a table in there and it's that size and all you get is the auditory information of it. You can keep track of that because it has one, two, three columns and one, two, three, four, five, six rows. OK, so if you are in your course and you build in a table and you put in 13 columns, because it's a real example, 13 columns and 44 rows, the student with the disability is going to have a hard time keeping track of that. So an accessibility way of building that is build multiple versions of that table and just build smaller versions of them. If you find a natural place, a very organically friendly way to divide the content up, it's all repeating, but if it's say alphabetically, 
then make a table for each letter of the alphabet. Or if it's you've got A, B, and C, and there's only four or six rows in there, uh, then, then do A, B, and C, and then go to D, E, and F, and divide it up that way so that the person with the accessibility need is able to access that content and keep track of it in the context that you want them to understand it. This is another universal design and learning principle. If you do it that way for people who have a visual impairment, feedback from students is they like that too because it's that philosophy of teach a little, test a little. You get them to first engage your content that way, and you are giving them bite-sized, digestible pieces of that content that they can look at and go, oh, wow. So if it's by years, divide it up by decades or maybe by uh, five years so that there's a very natural break in that information so that the students can engage it, but also keep track of it. Keep in, the, in mind universal design, and that will always be the best guide. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here at the end. So once again, we're back down to below that. So table, row, and header are read that way. Uh, heading four is once again, we're, we're there. And then uh, sufficient color contrast. So this is in our accessibility guide, and this is a big fight, uh, and I'm on this side, so just so you, just so you know. Um, when, they, when the screen reader gets to that, it will say, red text late assignments will earn 50 percent credit okay um uh you uh you you look at that and you think that's important the number one color this i'm gonna give you a a really interesting fact here the number one color that people with color blindness cannot see is red okay so i've worked with professional presenters people who go around the country and present and if they present and we're building out content for them and they want to use red to emphasize something, that is not a good answer ever. Use black. There's no sense in putting that there. If you want to increase the size of it, that's fine. But using red causes readability concerns for people with low vision. And, the number, and like I said, the number one thing that colorblind people uh, um, find out is they're colorblind and they never knew it and they're 40 years old. And they go, oh, wow, I never knew. I didn't know what the color red was. And so I'll give you another universal design and learning strategy here. It's why stop lights are set up the way they are. From left to right or from top to bottom, they don't change the sequencing of the lights. You have red, yellow, and green. When people with color, the reason that was designed that way was when those were first designed, they didn't know how to address uh, uh, accessibility in, in, the, in regards to color blindness. So they set up the lights so that they're bright and they, they will shine through and they just set them up like that. And whenever you would get a book to learn to drive, it would say also not just color, but it would also be lighting up the graphic to show you that that light was at the bottom. That was, what, that was a, a universal design and learning strategy from the 1950s. Um, Write meaningful text. That goes back to what I was talking about with the alt text there. So for instance, uh, in links. So when you're putting in a hyperlink, uh, right up here you see it says student accessibility resources. And then after it, uh, you see that that says open parentheses and then www.tccd.edu slash services slash supports services hyphen support services slash backslash student hyphen accessibility hyphen resources backslash close parentheses, period. That's what a screen reader would read. So here's the thing that you would, would that that's wrong here. And this is another point of contention. We're putting that hyperlink in there. And that blue where it says student accessibility resources, that's that thing where when you insert a link, it asks you for the text at the bottom, and then it asks you for the text that you want it to show. The hyperlink, when it's read by a screen reader, will say hyperlink to and then it will read student accessibility resources. If you put the uh, rest of that information in there, the screen reader will go open parentheses www dot or period actually it'll go open parentheses www do three open parentheses www period tccd period edu backslash services backslash support hyphen services backslash and so on and so on. That is a waste of the student's time to hear that 
It's also a waste of the student's time who is reading that to see that because they can click on that hyperlink there and access that conversation. Um, and so you want to put in write meaningful link text. You want them to know that that's a student accessibility resources hyperlink. So you want to include that as the text on that hyperlink. You can post the hyperlink in the uh, tool, and if the student wants to receive that information and they have an accessibility need, they can access that inside the document because it's embedded in, and they know how to do that. Or if they don't, they can access it, and that covers you legally if that's something that they request. Um, then you got heading three again, so I'm going through this step by step. Then a repeat of heading two, then a repeat of heading three, and then same thing down here. When using complex images, include alt text as you would for any other image, but also include additional subscriptions as a caption. And so that bo white box there is the alt text that's included as, as an additional description of that visual representation of home, home broadband users for people to uh, access and in, in, as far as accessibility concerns. It would read that to them. So it would get to that image, say that this is uh, an image of, and then if you alt text it and said an image of uh, that graphs home band users from January 4th to January 8th in percentage, you can build that out as a graph inside there and it would actually read each of those individual graph responses and it would scan across. But also this graph summarizes the growth using home band during the period of, and that would allow uh, accessibility users to access that information to give them support of what the graphic is representing. Um, at this Austin. Point, yes, ma'am. How do we know? Well, first, my first question is how do you get the hyperlink in there? And then my second question is how do we know what is appropriate to put for the alt text or not? Like being new to doing the accessibility, is there a way for us to know what's appropriate and not? So we know you told us not to put image in there, just put what the image is. Yes. Yeah. But for other things, like how do we know if it's right or not? Yeah. So we don't get in trouble. Not a problem. I'm sorry, who is this? Is this, this is De Leon. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to come back to that, De Leon. I'm not skipping over that. I just want to advance to the next slide right quick, but I'm going to show you all that here in a, uh, court, in a, in a document. So let me see. Make sure I'm still on. Okay, that's fine. I just didn't want you to keep yeah. going and I didn't ask and forgot. No, 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 and, I, and that's great. And actually, that's a, something I, I want to show you and, and something I can also, also give you in support of this to help you with that. Um, and these are all things that I just went through, so I'm moving through this fast um, because of the way this is presented. But I'm glad you asked that because you segued me beautiful. If I could, I'd give you $5 right now because you segued me beautiful to where I'm going to do. Go. Um, you've probably seen some version of this graphic before. Um, usually it ends with just the first two images. The last one represents universal design. And so I want to say that to y'all all right now. And it's a great image because uh, th in the first image, everybody's equal. Everybody's been given equal access, meaning that they all have the same size box. They have, all have the same size obstruction. In the next image, we've all considered each individual's needs and given them that. But accessibility UDL is like that. Not only is that kids able to see the game, but I would say out of the three, he's the, the, the smallest child. He's the safest one because if that ball gets kicked over there, it may scare him, but it ain't going to hit him in the face. So <laughs> that's why I think this is a great representation of, uh, um, is my camera on? Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, that's why I think this is a great visual representation of UDL. And that's why I think UDL is, uh, is incredible. This is about UDL and, uh, Oh, it does so title. Um, David didn't put a title on this. Um, and I'm going to talk to you more about that if you want to. And that may be something that we get to more uh, um, as experiential as y'all reaching out to me and we talk about UDL. I think I've talked about it enough. But I, I when David and I talked about this, I, I talked to him and showed him this graphic from CAST and he included this here. The thing about UDL is this, provide multiple means of engagement, provide multiple means of representation, provide multiple means of action and expression. If you do those three things, you are going to create uh, experiences for your students that is going to grow you as an instructor just as much as it's going to grow them as a student. Um, I don't know what that was. Y'all are, are still there, right? 
Something just happened on my computer. So that we're all ghosts now. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So, uh, so, so I'm gonna kill this, and I'm going to share a just a word document right quick, and then start answering some of your questions, and and hopefully give everybody some uh, content content here. And so I'm just looking for a word document that's open that I can show y'all. Uh, oh, this is about. Hey, this is about. Uh, can y'all see that? Yes. Yeah, we okay. can see the document. So you see this document here. Everybody sees this document here. Um, so it's just a Word document I'm working on for the Learning Symposium here. We were talking about cultural accessibility. Notice right here. So here's a great example. Here's a hyperlink right here, a blue hyperlink I included referencing myself, for referencing myself. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for just a second and check because it's saying I'm having... If everybody could quit sharing their camera. So if you'll down at the bottom, if you'll click on your camera and turn your camera off, uh, that helps with the bandwidth. So uh, Connie Dunn, if you'd look down on the bottom of your screen and the little bar, if you'll click on the camera icon, you'll quit sharing your camera. And uh, yeah, there you go. And that just helps with the bandwidth because we've got quite a few people in here and, and uh, everybody's on the internet right now. So I'm going to go back and share that document again with y'all. Uh, where did I put it? Uh, is that it? That is not it. My apologies. That is another one. That's a script. Y'all don't want to see my script. Y'all want to see... Well, now it's just being a jerk. Sorry, just one second. I just have to access this document again. There we go. All right. So y'all are seeing that document now. So here's a hyperlink at the bottom. This is I'm this is just a, something I'm working on for myself. So don't don't judge me on my accessibility here yet. Um, but there's the hyperlink. So let's let's go up here to our tools and we're gonna go to insert. And so I'm going to go down and I'm just going to copy that hyperlink. I'm doing con command C to copy that. And I'm going to go up and now I'm going to go to insert. And I'm going to go to links right here. And I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to say link. And right there, it brings up. Oops, sorry. Y'all can't see that. Sorry, let me. I'm going to have to change. My, my apologies. I'm doing something else wrong here. I'm going to have to stop sharing for a second so y'all see the pop-up windows. And the great thing about technology is, uh, is the mistakes Austin makes. So y'all have all of this on record that Austin is uh, far from perfect. Let me get my beautiful purple background up for y'all. So while he does that, I just want to say I posted a link to the sign-in sheet in your chat. If you don't have access to the chat, just send Rebecca or Austin an email and they can get you the link. Um, I also posted a link to a uh, guide for creating alt text. Um, it's actually built in Canvas, but it's a guide just generally on how to dis write descriptive text for images <clears throat> and a walkthrough guide of putting hyperlinks in Blackboard because Blackboard's a little clunky. It so um, you can refer back to those links um, anytime you want. And if you lose access to them or you forget, just send us an email. Yes. And so, uh, so I'm 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 my document again. I'm gonna start from the very beginning. So here's a hyperlink here, but imagine you're on a website and you just copied the hyperlink. I'm just copying this one here. And let's say I want to insert this right here. So I'm gonna put my cursor right there. You can see that we we'll put my cursor right there. And I'm gonna go up and I'm going to go to uh, insert on my menu. I'm gonna to go to link and I'm going to when I open that up, it says web page or file. This is a web page, and right here it says address. So all I did was I copied that address and I'm going to paste that address there. But if you notice, it says text to display here. So I'm going to say uh, instead of it, but it's going to repeat that there. But I'm going to instead of having that displayed, I want it to be um, culturally. You're going to have to, y'all are going to judge me. Don't judge me on my spelling yet. Responsive uh, teaching article. So that's what I wanted to say. So I've got that there. So I've hit web page. I've loaded the address in there and I'm going to hit OK. And now it's blue and it's underlined and it's a it's now a hyperlink. And when I click that hyperlink, 
it will take me directly to that page. So that was the first thing you would ask early on. What was the second thing you'd ask? Was it all? It was alt text, correct? Right, but so you have that in a Word document. I know how to make it. Well, I didn't know how to change the words, but I know how to hyperlink in a Word document. How do I now? You, I've seen where you all over the last couple of weeks have it actually in your Blackboard. Oh, okay. when you copy and paste this into Blackboard, is the hyperlink yeah. going to be there? Yes. Yes. And and if you do it directly in Blackboard, you do the same thing. You right click exactly. and it gives you the option to add a link. Oh, I love it. Thank look for the little things right there. If you want, I can show you that. But um, we have some we have we have some information on that. But do you feel okay about that, or do you want me to show you that? Oh no, I'm good. That's good. okay. Okay. So 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 just. So let's just do what you just did there, and I'm going to talk to you about that because you, once again, if I had five bucks and you were here, I'd give you. Everything begins with the written word. Uh, a movie as big as Star Wars or as the Avengers begins with the written word. So your courses begin with the written word. This is accessible, okay? So I can go up here and I can go across the tools here and I can do all these different things. And if you want, you can just come right to help and you can say, uh, type in the window, uh, check accessibility. It'll bring that up and it'll tell you right where to check it. And it'll give you accessibility information about that. Okay. And it'll, and it'll walk you through actually the process of making this accessible. And we're in Word. If you design in Word accessible documents and then you copy and paste those Word documents into your course, they're pretty much going to stay accessible. If they don't, you can bring those issues up individually and we can learn to do those for the most part. If you begin with a Word document, though, you can always embed that Word document in your course, and the students have access to the accessible document through Word, so they always have an accessible uh, alternative to your content in your course. I say that because I do a lot of video with people, so people always do this to me. They do one of two things whenever they're ready to make their videos. They either go, I'm terrified of getting in front of the camera, or I'll be fine, I will just wing it. OK, let me tell you about both of those. Everybody's terrified. It takes about three takes and then you get comfortable. Everybody who says I'll just wing it thinks that they're going to do that. And then I'm going to use a very technical term here. They end up sucking. They end up not doing well because there's about 10,000 ums in there. They uh, miss their point. Anytime you're going to build content for your course, start with a Word document because that always can be embedded in your course. You can always check it for accessibility. It's a UDL component. It's just one thing. If you were going to read all this information to a uh, um, to a court to a class in front of a monitor, I would load all of this into a, a, a teleprompter for you. You'd look at the camera, and the camera would be having the words come across it, and you'd be making eye eye contact with the camera as the words scrolled up as you read them. If you have the Word document. We could put the Word document of your original script in the course. When you're done with the video, we put all the graphics and make it look really cool and professional. We could put the video in your course. Then I could take the video and I could strip the, audio, the video off of it, load the audio file in there, and you have a UDL thing from one thing, from a Word document. You build a video off of it, you build an audio file off of it. The audio file is good for something without vision. Uh, they would be able to listen to the content. You as an instructor, I always challenge people whenever I have the time. And right now we're in a we're in what I call a pedagogy of crisis right now with COVID where I, you don't get this opportunity. But when you when things calm down and you do, I always challenge people whenever they really want to take the time and really look at the content in their course, read it into an audio player, record it, play it back to yourself with your eyes closed and ask yourself if I was a student hearing that for the first time, did I get all of the concepts that I want there? So it challenges you to be a better instructor. But from one thing we've got from a Word document, we've got an audio file, a video file, and a text file. That makes it 100% accessible. You'll never have a concern with a student when they come to you with an ADA need. But let's talk about six o'clock at night because it's my favorite example. So if you've heard this already, I apologize, but I love to use this example. You got a single parent, man or a woman, so I'm being very uh, equitable there. Uh, they have three children that they pick up at 530. They rush home, they throw on a pot of water, they're boiling the water, they throw on another pot, dump the prego in there, they're trying to make spaghetti, and they are taking one of your courses. If you have all of those options available, they can click on the video and listen to it while they're 
and watch it while they're making their uh, dinner for their them and their family. If they're driving to and from work, which the average commute time in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex is roughly 45 minutes, they can load that content onto their phone and they can listen to it while they drive. So if you create an audio file of it and they, they need to get better understanding and they watch the video, they can listen to the content again and that creates an auditory isolation experience for them where they're getting it in a different way. And that, that so accessibility through universal design does meet all students' requirements, but it's not just for students with an accessibility need. It's for all students. So you know, it's a better philosophy. Anytime somebody challenges me on that, I go, give me a scenario where it's not going to work. You know, and I, you know, I know we all get, can get become overwhelmed by things like accessibility needs. But the best thing is, is to build it in advance and it's never a concern for you. So that being said, I'm going to quit sharing my screen there for a second and let y'all ask me questions. And uh, and then Rebecca is going to answer them if I get stuck. So <laughs> any questions <laughs> you, can, uh, you can ask them uh, right now. I'm sorry. Cynthia, you have a question. Sorry. Yes, I just checked Blackboard and I thought I recalled uh, there was a tool available built in Blackboard that allowed you to select it and it would automatically read the text in Blackboard, but I just there, now don't uh, see it. It's There was. Um, is it not there? They might have taken that out for some reason, but you are correct. We had implanted a screen reader at one point. Let me, uh, I'm gonna, while we're talking, I'm going to uh, bring this up. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but let me look at Blackboard right quick. But you may be right. I didn't see it. I was just in there earlier today. And, and why would they take that away? Uh, well, no. Um, uh, for political reasons, I'm not going to answer that. Uh, yeah, I don't see it. You're correct. I don't see it. Uh, oh, yeah, I do. It's down in the corner. I'm sorry. Yes, I do. It's down in the corner. Um, do you see it? Are you looking down in the corner? See the little tab sticking out? And are you in Google Chrome? Are you still? Yes, I'm in Chrome, but I okay. still see don't a little see tab. Down, do you see a little tab down in your browser? Look, got a little micro or a little speaker and a little document on it. It's it's called Read Speaker. Activate Read Speaker, and it's on there right now. Like I'm on left my black side. Left hand side. Do you see it? Like I'm clicking it right now, and it may start reading it. By uh, actions for content. No, I still don't see it. Here, I'll, I'm sharing my screen. It's right down here, Cynthia. Where? I'm Look in the lower left hand corner, Cynthia, of Allegra's screen. And click on it, Allegra, and it'll expand out. Oh, I see, I see, I see. OK. That's it. And if you click that play button, it will automatically start reading your screen. So yes, it is still there. It used to be at the top, you're correct. And I think if you just slide those little arrows, yeah, you can move it up to the top. Somebody, somebody at the administrative level has moved it down to the bottom for some reason. If you move it back up to the top, it'll appear up there for you. Um, so thank you for Cynthia. That's uh, thank you for pointing out that tool, and I'm glad you're using that tool. Um, and uh, there was our other question. I saw Jennifer. I you right now. Now. <laughs> Jennifer, you had a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right. Fantastic. So I'm glad that you've taught art before because this may be something you can give me some insight on. I teach biology, um, and there are a lot of diagrams and uh, pictures that can be important for helping understand yes, the concept. And <laughs> I feel like so in some ways it's the same as art. Sometimes it's, it's really hard to get a, a deep, meaningful comprehension of something if you can't actually see it. it and, most is. and so what advice would you give for, uh, you know, my, my presentations in class when I did give them were highly visual in nature. And I, I'm coming to the realization that they weren't very accessible. So moving forward with what time we have left, what advice would you give me then for trying to make it more accessible for students who need to be able to listen to something more than they may be able to look at something? Okay. Um, and while I'm, while I'm about to do this, I'm going to answer your question, Jennifer, but it's going to be uh, uh, future thinking and also simultaneously I'm going to talk also, to you. Also before I go to Illy, Jennifer, I just want to tell you if you talk to Natalie Russell, she's our lab science instructor. Yes. She's worked a lot on making labs and demos 
accessible and universal. And so she has science specific expertise. Um, but with that, I've got to go to Illy. So if anybody has questions for me, just send me a chat or an email. Thank you. And so uh, yeah, I was yeah. going to reach out to Natalie. I know that she's, yes, so she's like that's our expert. First, that's the first thing I wanted to tell you was reach out to Natalie. And uh, and I'm going to open up something here. And this is the forward thinking part. And since y'all are all here, uh, um, I'm going to tell you about my background. So my background is in content development. And uh, uh, right now what's opening up is Adobe Illustrator. And so I'm going to share my screen with you here in a second. And uh, I think Dana, we were going to meet it too. Is that right, Dana? Uh, let me see. Can you hear me, Dana? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I see it. I see you respond there. I'm going to be late. <laughs> so, but we'll talk. I promise. Um, and Dana just reached out to me, and she wanted to set up a session where we were talking. And so. Um, and, and about, about some of the needs that she may have that may be specific to something you're talking about here, Jennifer. And I'm hoping a, a illustrator will open up here. But uh, so forward thinking is this, um, and I'm just making sure my document's open before I share this with y'all. Um, let me go back and find my image. Uh, there it is. So yeah, here it goes, sorry. So I'm gonna share my screen with y'all. So my goal is always to get you ready. So we're talking about biology. So right here, we're looking at the skeleton of a dog. I'm just kidding, we're actually looking at a human. Um, but we're looking at a human skeleton, right? And so I built this and this image can be pulled apart however I wanna pull it apart, okay? So I need to link those together real quick um so now this image i can pull it apart however i want to pull it apart up to and including getting down to the sagittal suture and things like that so if you would imagine jennifer if you called me and said austin i want to talk about creating mitochondria i always use this example when i'm talking to biology people mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell i want to show how that works i want to show how sodium and sugar exchange inside of there we will build an animation of that and we will make an accessible animation of that where you can, uh, we'll create a video of that, interaction of that. We can also create a digital model of that where your students can access that. And we just got this, this is why I'm excited about you asking this question. We just got a tool called Articulate where you can create these components, isolate them inside there, build content, build your textbook out. Natalie is aware of it. Natalie's reached out to me over the last year and say, hey, I wanna build an interactive textbook. And that's why we was, I was really excited about getting that tool. Now, I would love for you to be a part of that. So I'm, that's why I'm excited about you doing that. So the content you want to build, I would love to help you build. Um, but right now this thing COVID happened. And so we may have to uh, go slow, but that is my goal. And so if you tell me you need to build something, this is I'm completely aware of your needs because when I build something, I build it where we can tear it apart like that and you can zoom in, I'm gonna zoom in with the camera. So you can zoom into this thing and you can imagine if we've built a cell, we could zoom in and we can see that close of a detail of that, or we can uh, zoom out and have the whole skeleton and tear him apart and make him move and dance and talk about stress on joints or whatever you wanna talk about whenever we're doing those things. I built one for Natalie, uh, I'm going to uh, exit here and I will show you right quick. This was one of the rough ones we built at the beginning. Uh, when Natalie and I first started to do the little dance that everybody does together when they get to know each other. And Natalie said, I want to talk about digestion. Uh, and if you've seen this video already before, uh, you, 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 um, you just let me know. But uh, let me get down to the bottom here. Sorry. And where is Natalie's? Yeah, here it is. Sorry. So I'm going to drive this. are hydrophobic. They so is don't this, do uh, well. Are y'all seeing water, that? Right? They clump up together. But Do you see that right there? No, the video isn't showing for me. Okay, let me reshare my screen right quick uh, for everybody. But uh, this is on our YouTube channel. And can you see that now? Yeah. Okay, and so this is just a video on YouTube. There's audio with it. You can hear Natalie Black talking cases here. cases 
can only make contact then with the very outside of these fat. And so we're walking through the digestive system. But if you watch at the very beginning here, a hamburger flies in and the, the model takes a bite of the hamburger and then he starts to turn it into a bolus. And then the bolus goes all the way through the digestive system. And uh, my favorite part is at the end when it becomes waste, instead of actually building a piece of uh, fecal matter, we put in the poop emoji and the poop emoji, as you will see, moves through the rest of the remainder of the digestive system. So it's moving out and then ultimately it moves out the uh, uh, anus. We're all we're all adults here. We can say anus, right? Uh, You're good. It moves out. Here and this, like I said, this is we, this was a, a sample to get Natalie on board and get her to understand. But same thing, just built out the digestive system and illustrator. All of these things can be taken apart so we could pull the stomach over, or we could make a more realistic representation of the stomach. Or when like the bolus gets to the stomach, you can see it I'm going backwards, so it's kind of gross. Um, but there's the bolus inside the stomach there. Uh, you can see it appearing and it's actually exiting the stomach there. But there it is inside the stomach getting uh, saturated by the digestive acids and things like that. So your imagination and your voice and your content development as a su subject matter expert matched with uh, my skills as an artist and illustrator and animator and all that stuff. Uh, whatever you want to do, we'll figure it out. It sounds like, though, you're really recommending, though, that if there are like processes or diagrams of those processes, that, you know, a lot like when you'd be face to face with the class, you would suggest that we auditorially talk through each of those specific steps rather than saying, look at this part of the image, look at this part of the image, see what's going on here. Well, right? you ever used, when you use Photoshop, or excuse me, not Photoshop, PowerPoint, do you ever use the arrows and pointers and things in there, the animated arrows and pointers? Uh, sometimes it just kind of depends. Yeah, well, I can help you with that too. So let's imagine once again, going back to the cell and you want to show movement of uh, sodium out of the cell. Uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, I'm, 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 I have cursory biology understanding. Uh, so the sodium is evacuating the cell, for instance, and we want to show that in a motion with an arrow. Instead of an arrow, we could really quickly create just something that looks like fluid moving out, or we could create the, is it negative for sodium or positive for sodium? I always forget. Um, Am I getting that right? Or is it just SA? It's just SA isn't it? Uh, for sodium. Whatever it is, we can N make N A. <laughs> yeah, we can make. But yeah, like they're ev evacuating the cell or whatever it is you want to do there. And those are things we could do now. And if you already have graphics, then you and I should get together and meet and talk about how to best utilize those graphics in your online class this semester and create some animations in them uh, that will uh, help you get through it. And uh, and you, I'm gonna uh, uh, lean to you to say to me, Austin, I wanted to kind of do this, and then I'll go, okay, what if we do this? And then we'll build that thing out inside there, if that makes sense. But yeah, there, well, are, you. Ways, there are ways to do that, so just so you know. I'm gonna stop sharing because I'm sure there's other people with their hands up and I don't have my uh, uh, thing up. But uh, Cynthia Burris, are you, uh, did you still have a question, Cynthia? Or, or, uh, no, you got it, thank you so okay. much. No problem, and, uh, and, and, and once again, I do wanna say to y'all, uh, I had to move through this pretty quick, uh, we just, if we were talking about in a percentage point, how much of about understanding we have of understanding accessibility, uh, I'd say 1%. To, to not to be sarcastic or mean or to be defeating, but I would just say a 1% understanding of it. But I would say you're going to encounter things, and when you get to that thing, just reach out to me. Just type in Austin Haynes in your email and reach out and say, Austin, I need to figure out how to make this thing accessible, and I'll be glad to help you with that. So are there any other questions? Nothing else? Well, I do want to say thank you all for y'all's time today. Thank you all for attending these sessions. And, and once again, don't think that we're leaving you. Uh, we're here. Uh, I'm not here, not here, meaning I'm just here starting the first day of school. I'm here all summer. Uh, tip your waiters because I'll be they'll be needing that money. But uh, you, if you need something, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are here to help. And so we're glad to help as always. So there's oh, there was Cynthia, do you have another question? Oh, no, I didn't think I raised my hand. Sorry. Well, for some reason, it's showing it up again. Uh, and so thank you. Thank you all. And if there's no other questions, I'm going to go meet with some lady named Dana. So I will. Dana, you and I'll go meet up now. And uh, um, I'd be glad to talk to anybody about anything else you need. Just send me an email and we'll set up a session just like that. And I'll, I'll uh, Dana, I will send you a, uh, I'll call you or whatever. Thanks, everybody. I recorded this session.
Um, eventually, uh, it, you can reach out to me if you want to get a, uh, access to it, if you want to reflect on some of the stuff, this uh, information. Uh, um, and I'd be glad to send, that, send you that link. Just let me know. Thanks, Rebecca. You're awesome. I miss seeing you in person. And I miss all you folks. And y'all take care. And uh, yeah, NA plus. There we go. Uh, thank you very much. Y'all take care. Be safe. Thanks, Austin. Bye-bye. Y'all be good. Talk to you later.